Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 17th of October. I wanted to make sure everyone was actually aware that I do have kind of chapters for all of the content in the videos. If you actually just quickly, I'll give you an example here. If you go and look at, for example, last week's video, you notice down the bottom here, you can hover over and I have chapters for all of the different levels of updates and it is all called out in the description so you can jump to the ones you need and it has the various descriptions and links for things I might mention. So I just want to make sure everyone was aware that was part of kind of the, the Azure update. Those chapters are all here, so I'm just kind of calling out that fact. As always, if this is useful, uh, please like, subscribe, comment and share and uh, hit that bell icon. So new videos this week, and there's actually a, a huge number of them because what actually happened was, so I did one about the new Azure Architect certification path, and then I did my regular Tuesday kind of Azure AD synchronization option. So I really did a comparison of Azure AD Connect versus the Azure AD Connect Cloud Sync, and when you could use which, maybe how they work together. Then I did a video on using the Azure Static Web Apps to host a website for free with custom domains and HTTPS, and I had some different scenarios. But then I did a walkthrough of that. So I created an example scenario of hosting a redirect page that could go to your YouTube channel. So I did a step-by-step -step from start to finish, setting up the Git repo, setting up the static web app, and adding a custom domain and seeing it in action. And then just for a bit of fun, I actually did a fireside chat with a group of uh, Cloud Solution Architects in Australia on Wednesday. So I edited and recorded that a bit, if you're interested. It's not really very focused on Azure, it's more about overall how I think about work and life and stuff like that. New features. So on the compute side, a huge amount around the Azure Kubernetes service. Remember the Azure managed Kubernetes offering. This is because there was a big Kubernetes conference this week. So firstly, there's now HTTPS proxy configuration support when I'm doing my deployment. So one of the problems in the past was when I create my AKS cluster, there's a certain amount of bootstrapping that has to happen to get initial configuration and variables and certs over HTTPS. Well, if I was using a proxy, it couldn't get that and it would get stuck. So now what I can do is when I'm creating my AKS cluster, my node pools, I can now integrate with a HTTPS proxy through configuration so we can go and do that initial bootstrap, get those certificates, get that configuration, and it will work. Kubernetes 1.22, the latest version, a whole bunch of updates is now in preview, so you can go and leverage that. And now we actually have IPv6 dual stack for KubeNet. So there's two important points there. The first is it's dual stack. It's IPv4 as well. You cannot just have IPv6. We always need IPv4 today for the management plane anyway. But now I can also have IPv6. Now you could choose to just use IPv6 for the workload part, absolutely, but there will still be IPv4 there. And it is KubeNet today. So remember KubeNet is where the pods themselves get IP addresses from an isolated IP space in the cluster, and then that traffic is natted through, through the nodes themselves that have valid IP addresses. I cannot do dual stack today with, for example, Azure CNI, where the pods get actual IPs from the virtual network. That is not available. There's a lot more work that has to go into that. They announced uh, WASI workload support in preview. So this is the WebAssembly system interface. And this is all based around this CNCF, the same people who kind of manage the Kubernetes uh, set of standards. There's a Crustlet project. And what this is all about is we're used to the idea of on Kubernetes, we run things in containers. And those containers give us, remember that certain user mode isolated space. So the whole point of this WebAssembly is it's this new portable open standard for a new binary format that is memory safe. So it has its own kind of sets of isolation built into it, but it doesn't run in a container and it runs at near native performance. So now this crustlet is this new Kubernetes kubelet that enables me to run these things. 
So now I can create these WASI node pools actually on my AKS service. So there's a whole bunch of new information. I've got a link in the description if you want to go and read about crustlets. But this is in preview. And then AKS um, now has an out of tree cloud provider controller. Um, this is in preview. So if you think about Kubernetes, a whole bunch of different cloud providers offer Kubernetes managed offerings. Azure is one of them. And ordinarily, what was happening in the past was that AKS, for example, its cloud provider was in tree. It was part of the core Kubernetes. That meant any changes they wanted to make to it had to go through that Kubernetes change cycle, their own release cycle. So that could actually potentially slow down fixes and enhancements. So what's now happening, the cloud controller is moving out of tree, i.e. it's out of the core Kubernetes code base. So now the AKS team can update the code, they can have new releases outside of the Kubernetes release cadence. And so now, hey, we can just see the Kubernetes and the AKS teams can update this when they need, maybe meet customer requests a bit quicker. The Azure Static Web App now has a function-based role assignment. So currently, there's an invitation system for me to assign roles to users. So based on the authentication provider, be it Azure AD or GitHub or whatever it might be, I can assign certain roles to identities. That's stored in the JSON file. What this enables me to do is at the point of authentication, it actually calls an Azure function. Remember, Azure function is a serverless piece of code. Now, that serverless piece of code now can do anything. It could go and look up something in a database that maybe maps roles. It could do a, an API call, whatever you want it to do, and it will then return the roles for the identity. So rather than having them statically assigned in this JSON file, hey, I can now use a function to go and work out what the role should be. Also, Azure Static Web Apps now have an IP-based set of website protections. So remember, the Azure Static Web App is providing a website. There's now the ability to have IP-based rules and actually service tags as well that I can configure through the configuration files. I don't think it's in the portal yet, but I can actually do it through the config file so I could give specific sets of IP ranges. Or for example, I could say, hey, I want Azure front door. And if we look at the example over here, so it shows us kind of an example of the configuration. And notice here in this example, it has things like, hey, yeah, um, the allowed ranges that it's configuring, but I think maybe lower down. So here we see, this actually gives us an example of using a service tag. So instead of specifying an IP range, I can use service tags as well. So I do have choices in actually how I want to do that. So that's a, a nice new capability. Next, so we have those container insights for Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes. Remember, Azure Arc is all about bringing Azure services to other infrastructure outside Azure. Maybe it's on premises, maybe it's in another cloud provider. And there's Arc for servers, but it's also, for example, Azure Arc for Kubernetes, any CNCF compatible Kubernetes cluster. And once it has that, it can then lay down other services like the data services, the PaaS services, machine learning. But Container Insights, remember, are those set of curated metrics and views that we have for different services. So now the Container Insights is available for Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes as well. So we get those great insights about performance information for the containers, the nodes, the controllers, all those things is available to me. And it is insights, which means it sits on top of Log Analytics Workspace. So it is sending data to a Log Analytics Workspace. On the networking side, so Azure Firewall Premium is available in new regions, um, US Gov Texas and US Gov Arizona and US Gov Virginia, so US Gov, then also China North 2 and China East 2, so basically sovereign clouds. Premium, the, there were a number of big features, and I did a whole deep dive video on Azure Firewall and I demoed all the premium features. But one of the biggest things was the ability to inspect TLS traffic, encrypted traffic. It basically would sit in the middle and generate certificates so the client could talk to it, it could read it and then send it on. 
So I can now inspect TLS protected traffic. That then let me do web categories, even for TLS traffic, and I could base it on the path, because I can now see the path, not just the DNS name. I could do um, URL filtering, even if TLS, there was intrusion detection. And again, I dive into all those details, but it's now hey, available in those kind of sovereign regions. And on GitHub, they actually released this really nice network security dashboard for Azure Security Center. Again, the link's in the description below, but if we super quickly um, jumped over to it, so let's bring up the web browser for a second. So if I jump over and go and look at Security Center, so I've already done the deployment. Um, the URL, let me see if I can grab that super quickly. Oh, it's in the description. But once you've deployed it, you get this workbook. And if I just go to my regular workbooks, what you'll see is, hey, I've got this new network security dashboard. Now this is not using Log Analytics, so I'm not spending any money on Log Analytics workspace. It's all based around Graph API queries, so it's real time. And it's gonna give me information about all my different networking resources, uh, public IPs, exposed ports, network security services, I am using uh, DDoS services, my internal networks, gateway, VPN, traffic manager, security recommendations, all kind of summarized and these great set of views that I can actually leverage for my environment. So it's completely free. It's not using log analytics, so it's not even gonna cost me any sort of storage in log analytics. So I definitely would recommend um, go out and play around with that. Next, on the database side, actually quite a lot of updates. So MySQL Flexible Server. So remember, Flexible Server is kind of this new version of the managed databases that's built actually on virtual machines instead of kind of those containers. So I can start, stop them. It had burstable SKU support. I could have optional automatic HA. It supports availability zones, a whole bunch of features. But now I have geo-redundant backup restore. So you have these snapshots taken daily automatically instead of using the default LRS storage, where there's three copies, but within the region, now I can have GRS, so asynchronously it copies to the paired region, well, I could actually then restore there. So I have that ability, if there's some regional level disaster, I could actually restore in the paired region. Likewise, Postgres SQL Flexible Server now has these new types of VM support, so the DDSV4 and EDSV4. So they're based on the second gen Intel Xeon Platinum, the Cascade Lake processors. So it's faster compute, they've got larger local solid state drives, SSDs, so I can get very high speed, low latency local storage. And it's just one of the choices we now have when I create my flexible servers. PostgreSQL Hyperscale, so remember Hyperscale is based on the PostgreSQL Citus extension that makes it distributed. So that coordinator node, and then I can now shard my database over multiple servers, so I get fantastic scale, fantastic performance. So now that hyperscale offering has private endpoints. Remember, private endpoints, instead of accessing a service through its public-facing IP, I can essentially not have that, and instead I access an instance of a service by an IP address it takes from my subnet. So I just access it via an IP in my subnet, which will then point to a specific instance of the service. So that's great for really locking things down of my security. Azure Hybrid Benefit, so that's the ability, hey, I have licenses, I wanna be able to leverage them in the cloud, it reduces my cost in the cloud, now has a centralized management capability in preview. So instead of now having to think about, hey, I wanna assign each license to an individual Azure resource, like a virtual machine, the billing administrators can now actually assign and manage the SQL Server licenses at an Azure subscription level or an entire Azure account level as part of my enterprise agreement. So it's gonna simplify all of that. For Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance, it now supports transparent data encryption with a customer managed key. So this is, hey, I'm gonna bring my own key, storing in my Azure Key Vault, and now that key is gonna be the TDE protector. So I have full control of the life cycle of that 
data encryption key that's been stored in my key vault. And for SQL Server, this is set at the SQL Server level. So it would get inherited by all the database instances under that server. Um, for SQL MI, it's set at the instance level. So it would be inherited by all of the databases within that instance. But now, hey, I can have full management of the key that's really governing that encryption. HD Insight, so remember HD Insight is that managed open source service enabling frameworks like Hadoop, uh, Apache Spark, uh, Kafka, a whole bunch of other ones. Two updates, so restricted public connectivity. Think about my HD Insight deployment now for things like cluster communication to the resource provider is now in this new um, controlled networking no public IP addressing for resources. And I can actually now, from HD Insight, access private link-enabled services. So via private endpoints, access my SQL, my storage, my key vault, whatever that might be. And then likewise, I can now use a private endpoint to get to my HD Insight instance. So think about it, hey, HD Insight can get to stuff over private endpoints now that it wants to use and I can get to my HD Insight over private endpoint as well. And there was also an announcement about um, for Synapse, there are now some pre-purchase plans available, so you can get some nice big discounts there as well. Miscellaneous, uh, really just PowerShell 7.1.5 was released. This is a bigger deal than usual. There was, I think, a, a problem in a previous version that te telemetry was maybe sending Maybe, I think I think it was server names, the things it maybe shouldn't have been doing. This is fixed in 7.1.5, so you might want to go and get that out. So that's all the updates for this week. Um, I, I should be on time next week. I'm doing this Dallas Spartan Ultra next week on Saturday. That's just over 30 miles, like 60 obstacles. It's probably going to take me 9, 10 hours, but I should be uh, all good. So this should be there as normal. But I hope that was useful. As always, I really appreciate you watching and supporting the channel. Till next week, take care.